Dana Miller presents the ninth annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring John Hernreed, MD, Weight Management and Diabetes. Let me go ahead and introduce myself. Um, I'm uh, John Hernreed. Um, I'm an internist by uh, training and did primary care and, and such, but have been really focused um, pretty much exclusively on obesity medicine uh, for uh, exclusively since 2005. Um, I just saw it as a great opportunity. I was really fascinated by the disease uh, and helping people. And um, so part of my, uh, even though I don't have academic titles, my interest has been in sort of the uh, the delivery of, of care and how to be able to, to create models uh, to expand it. So I have a series of different clinics. Um, I utilize a variety of different tools, and our uh, tools continue to advance as the um, technologies and the opportunities continue to advance as well. So um, it's, it's something I just absolutely love to do. So um, probably my, my favorite thing to do in terms of, of in obesity medicine is um, the particular type of diet that I use um, is one that I get people off their, I tell them to stop their, anti their diabetes medicines day one. Um, and I have a feeling it's some, something similar to what the bariatric surgeons feel where they say just stop your medicine. So um, it's it just incredibly gratifying to be able to do that. Um, if they're on insulin, they're usually off their insulin uh, within about a week or 10 days. Uh, but their pills, they stop immediately. And so it, it just, after spending so much time um, in my career adding medications on, uh, it's just a great joy. And I can do the same thing with antihypertensives um, but, uh, and, it just, and watching them get better, um, it really is what, what drives me. So um, I, I work in teams, so I have um, teams of behavioral educators, uh, dietitians, uh, Clinicians work with me. Uh, we have exercise physiologists, one of whom you'll meet tomorrow. Um, and so we work together uh, in, in terms of treating obesity as a, as a chronic disease. So uh, really, uh, I've, so much of this, and even more and more, is, is related to diabetes. And again, I think that's what we can do here in, in obesity medicine um, is just really, really powerful, and it's under-recognized. I know most people, they, they want to come, they want to lose weight, but if you're a diabetic, um, you have so many things going against you, and uh, our ability to rapidly get the patients out of medical risk, uh, improve, improve things, uh, is just incredibly powerful. So that's what I'm going to focus on today, um, uh, is sort of learning, trying to bridge the sort of traditional standard of care, of diabetes care, um, for which I've been involved in and, and still partially involved in. I do a little bit of hospital medicine and uh, deal with a lot of diabetic patients and load up people on insulin uh, like crazy there. Um, and, um, and, um, but also, so talking about what the current standard of care is, what's wrong with it, what's right with it. Uh, then we'll really talk about, well, what really should be our goal? If we have the ability to put a patient in remission, should we be trying to do that? Even if it's just for shorter term. Uh, we'll talk about more nutritional treatment for uh, diabetes for remission. Uh, we'll go into pharmacotherapy for diabetes and then really uh, combining therapies. So um, much of my topic um, will probably cover some of the other things that uh, you've heard already um, and, and um, that you'll hear a little later on, but uh, hopefully that will help to, to sync this, uh, help to sort of cement this because I think uh, in this day and age, we really have some good options that are more and more becoming uh, accepted and even, even mainstream. So there is a little theme that I put together um, in, in developing this course um, because I, uh, around both treating metabolic, uh, we see as a metabolic disease, so a fair amount of diabetes lectures, but also um, the concept of nutritional ketosis uh, was one that we've talked about. Most people, uh, as, as uh, the previous speaker talked about, it was you know, controversial. It's a little less controversial. And I can tell you our patients are doing it, and especially the millennials. Um, but keto is in. Uh, it may not be in, in the right way. So it's important for us to learn how to about it, maybe even come to a better understanding of it, uh, maybe even start to utilize it. Uh, it's something I've been able to utilize uh, in my center um, for, for many years, and uh, I see increasing promises. So. All right, so my conflicts, very few. I do speak for Novo, um, and I'm on the medical advisory panel for Robard. 
Uh, my other conflict, now that my kids are, are gone, uh, I miss my dog, Barkley, my puppy, Barkley. He's my first puppy. So um, I'm conflicted being here and missing him. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, standard of care and uh, what for diabetes. We're not really necessarily talking about weight loss here and what I'm seeing out there. And I've really have tried to, I really tried to make this lecture fair and balanced, um, even though I may have some, I do have some internal biases of what I've been seeing in terms of the care of diabetic patients in the community where, where I'm working. Um, and that, um, and, and I was really having a tough time. I even then went and did a intensive review or intensive course through Mayo Clinic um, that costs a lot, and I, it was just really disappointing and, and nothing really addressing how to get uh, to treat the underlying metabolic condition. It was more a matter of, more sort of just managing things. So um, I always like to start by, with this uh, because uh, we are finally getting out of the low fat is the only way to do that, and we uh, keep hearing that, and I think we're finally out of that that's the only way to go. Um, I do like this, that the fallacy of eating fat will make you fat is about as scientifically logical as saying that eating tomatoes will turn you red. So um, you know, a few years ago, this would have been something that was you know, just heresy uh, and uh, trying to get people uh, comfortable with this. But now um, I think we're understanding, and you heard from the previous lecture, fat's okay. Uh, and, uh, and it needs to be balanced and, and done properly and done scientifically. Uh, but uh, there, there clearly are benefits, and we'll be talking, uh, showing you the evidence around it. So I, what's, what's sort of still the standard of care? It has evolved somewhat, uh, but uh, let me share with you at least a couple of societies. These are the, um, the Endocrine Society, or this is ACE, I'm sorry, the ACE, uh, one of the Endocrine Societies, uh, about what uh, their, their standard of care recommendations, um, and this is from their 2015, and really, in, if you look through the recommendations, there's really nothing about truly uh, how to do nutritional intervention for treatment of diabetes. I just I looked through, and there was just some general general concepts about management, but nothing about you know really trying to get rid of diabetes rather than loading up on medicine. So uh, this is their one of their things, and uh, they do it just like the ADA does, which I'll show you in a moment about. Uh, rec specific recommendations. And this is basically the recommendation is that you should be eating seven to 10 healthy uh, servings uh, of healthful carbohydrates, which includes fresh fruits and vegetables, legumes and whole grains, um, and seven to 10 servings a day. So um, I think, and I don't know about you, but in my practice, uh, and I've learned now, never tell a patient, you know, five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables because it's four and a half servings of fruit and a half serving of vegetables. So I'm, I'm very, very careful about separating that out um, and uh, because we want to be, we're pretty carb sensitive where we work. So again, this isn't going to get a patient um, out of, off their medications. Um, this is a, um, a, real, a real concern. Sorry about that. There's Barkley. Okay. So um, what about the American Diabetes Association? So they, this is what they recommend, and they have a few different things, nutritionally in terms of management. So their recommendation for treatment of diabetes uh, is disease self-management. Now I get this. You've got millions and millions of Americans. You have only so many practitioners. Um, so it, you know, you've got to try to spread around the masses. But is that the right way? Well, this was actually done uh, by the Endocrine Society looking at self-education, self um, um, self-support as versus ILI, which is intensive lifestyle intervention. And uh, in terms of uh, weight loss, um, overall, I mean, it's uh, almost two and a half times better using intensive lifestyle. So why are they recommending a therapy of diabetes self-education when they have a much more powerful tool with newer ways of, of managing this to the masses that is so much better? So things are evolving, but there's still a lot of dogma in and th that is a problem. This is their recommendations, a summary of their recommendations for nutrition, the ADA. Um, they, they've gone from just sort of low fat, and as you heard from previously, there's still about, you know, and I keep hearing from dietitians, patients need carbohydrates to think. They need, di uh, and that's really not, not true. So um, the, the fact is that they say, at least they're up to saying, well, well at least we'll individualize it. So. Um, that, that's at least a step versus, you know, this is the exact way of doing it. Nevertheless, they recommend a variety of eating patterns that are acceptable uh, for management of type 2 diabetes, including Mediterranean, DASH, and plant-based diets, 
for which, um, in terms of long-term evidence, not a whole lot in terms of, of getting the patients out of medical risk. Uh, and then they talk about the fact that uh, macronutrient content, um, that they're all sort of equally effective. Well, no, not necessarily. And there's evidence to show that. Why are they saying that? Um, so uh, before I do that, um, let, me, let me address a couple other things they're talking about. And I'll be addressing metabolic uh, bariatric surgery here. Obviously, we heard quite a bit from Dr. Morton, but uh, really, as we'll talk about, there's really no more powerful tool for getting patients out of risk, medical risk, than, than bariatric surgery. So uh, their recommendations for bariatric surgery is recommend it if the patient's inadequately controlled. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're at a point where we know that a patient uh, who is controlled is still having a lot of problems. They're eventually going to get to the point where they're burning out their pancreas uh, and need insulin. And rather than that, it, it's worthwhile intervening earlier. So um, uh, this is their, the ADA's recommendation, and um, I, think, I think there's still a ways off. And it frustrates the bariatric surgeons to, to no end as well. So let's talk about um, what are prescribed for uh, diabetes therapy still in this day and age. And I see this. We have a, a diabetes a care center in our area. Um, and uh, I still see in general patients, uh, you know, everyone gets put on metformin unless they can't tolerate it. Great. Uh, and we know that at least that's weight neutral. It may lead to a little bit of weight loss, not a huge amount. Uh, so these are the various medicines that we know uh, cause weight gain, which is the sulfonylureas, TZDs, and insulin. Uh, neutrals, at least the D DPP-4 inhibitors, and there's actually a few uh, that uh, cause weight loss. Um, metformin's in there, again, not, not a great weight loss drug. Uh, the SGLT-2 inhibitors and then the GLP-1s, which um, uh, we'll be talking about later and you'll be hearing more about tomorrow. But so what, what are we still using in uh, 2018? This is the ADA's recommendations for pharmacotherapy, and I'll share ACEs in a moment. Um, but basically, uh, there, there's monotherapy, dual therapy, and triple therapy. And what you see here, you know, monotherapy is metformin. Everyone gets put on that, and many of us believe it should be in the water supply, and that's great. Uh, but their recommendations, they immediately start talking about sulfonylureas and TZAs. You know, that's their, their number one and number two. And they have these other ones here, but they, these are still very much emphasized uh, in various communities. They, they are inexpensive, but uh, they're not really addressing the underlying metabolic risk. And uh, eventually, these patients uh, who are doing this are going to end up needing insulin. So, um, and likewise, when you're getting up to triple therapies, uh, they're very quickly going to insulin as well. So um, I, I just don't think that in this day and age, when we have the tools we have uh, that you're going to be hearing about over the next couple of, of days, that this is necessarily the optimal approach uh, to, uh, to care of our diabetes patients, especially with the rapidly increasing number of diabetic patients in the United States. This is, uh, let me go back to the endocrinologist. Uh, at least they are a little bit better. Uh, uh, clear, this is uh, some of their recommendations. They will talk about, whoops, sorry about that, um, about which ones cause weight loss, weight gain. It's a pretty busy slide, but it's this one. So uh, at least they're, they're addressing this a little bit better. And in their recommendations, they have something very similar to the ADA, uh, and this is from 2017. Um, again, metformin is a monotherapy, but at least they are putting in the, oh, it's just advancing on its own, uh, the GLP-1s and some of the other weight neutral or weight losing drugs more at the top, a little bit more emphasizing. So not that I necessarily see that in my clinical, pr in, my, in my community, or when I get a patient in who's diabetic and needs to lose weight, but uh, at least it, it's... Um, addressing it a little bit better that way, but still very quick to go to insulin. So why, when I showed you about, and it's still the recommendation of, well, any diet will do, um, and it doesn't really matter, and, and indeed, a diet, you've got to be able to do long-term adherence to a diet. There's no doubt, uh, doubt about that. I think uh, if a patient's failing a particular diet, um, there's, uh, it needs to be investigated a little bit more than saying, well, they just need to try something else that will work for them. It's part of our responsibility to help the patient, to coach the patient uh, into, uh, uh, into a, 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 new therapy, a new lifestyle. So um, this, again, comes from the endocrinologist. And where they, the, this is where the recommendations came from about, well, it doesn't really matter whether you do low fat or low carb. Uh, it ends up being about the same. So uh, this is their me uh, meta-analysis that came from them. And over here, it says favors low fat. Over here, it says uh, favors low carbohydrate. 
Um, more are on the low-fat diet. Uh, more these, these are the different studies in the meta-analysis, and a few in the low-carbohydrate diet. So from that, it goes, well, we shouldn't really be talking about low-carbohydrates. Why are we doing that? Um, this is an, another one. This is from the um, uh, 2013 American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I know this is really, really hard to see. Um, it was, um, but basically looking at uh, a diabetes approach and nutrition, again, the uh, uh, left side here favors low carbohydrate, right side favors other types of diets, generally low fat. Uh, and it's a little mixed here, but uh, again, the recommendations out of this is that really doesn't matter what type of diet you do, uh, any diet is going to be effective. So um, you, I'm, this is where these standardized recommendations come from and uh, from these pooled analysis. But there's problems with it. Um, and uh, I do want to take you uh, to a couple of other ones. And this is why we're getting mixed messages, um, as well as our patients are really getting mixed messages. And for primary care physicians who are doing a, a bulk of the management for type 2 diabetes, uh, it's really, really hard to, um, uh, to, you know, to, to try to sort this out. So I'll help you out with this a little bit. So this is a, a study that was done, um, or a literature review, another literature review, that really focused a um, little bit more on, this is Dr. Feynman, the 2015 Dr. Feynman study that was um, in nutrition, uh, really looking at it a little bit more. And th uh, this is basically the bottom line of this is that more of the studies, at least in, his, in this meta-analysis, favor low carb. So what gives? Why is that, that you have some that say favors low fat versus low carb? The major reason, if you look at the previous studies, these and this one, the definition of low carb was all over the board. So low carb in this meta-analysis went from anywhere from 5 grams of carbohydrates to 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. So I think this is really unfair to, to lump 100 grams of carbohydrate a day as low carb. So I, again, I think that's part of what the issue is, and I think it's really skewing our message to the patient of what we should be doing. So uh, when you actually sort of stabilize out for carbohydrates, you start getting more like this, and we'll show you a couple of other ones as well, where, uh, in fact, low carbohydrate um, uh, really can, can make a difference. Okay? Um, again, the, the, same, the same study here. Uh, so bottom line of this, carbs matter. And uh, so it is, when we're talking about low-carbohydrate or very low-carbohydrate diets with nutritional ketosis, we need to be very, very clear of what that's about. Um, and, and because people's definition of low-carbohydrate is really all over the board. Um, I do some genomic testing for our patients uh, where part of the recommendation is what type of diet they get matched, either a low-fat diet to a low-carb diet to a Mediterranean diet. Um, and, but if you look at the recommendations for the diets, they're almost, they're within like five percentage points uh, of, the, of macronutrients. It, it didn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, carb, but in this case, carbs do matter. So this was a, another study uh, just uh, published last year uh, where it was looking at moderate carbohydrate versus very low carbohydrate diet uh, and the drop in treatment with hemoglobin A1C. And you can see a, a significant difference um, and statistically significant. So carbs matter. Okay, so why is that? Um, well, we, this, is, uh, this is where I love helping my patients who come in. They, they're f coming in obese, they're fatigued, uh, their blood sugar is generally not under optimal control, or if it is under optimal control, they're on their number of different medicines that cause weight gain, um, and uh, they're not moving as much. Uh, they usually have osteoarthritis in a lot of cases. So what's really happening here? I thought this was a really nice slide, um, sort of d just the various different mechanisms that um, what we understand about obesity uh, as a metabolic disease is that there is a, a, there is a dysregulation of our ability to uh, control the, uh, the amount of body fat. And when we have excess body fat, uh, we get subcutaneous uh, fat expansion, um, and then that becomes, um, becomes dysfunctional in itself. So uh, what happens then, we get uh, increasing free fatty acid storage um, and decreased triglyceride storage. These uh, lipids then go to the liver, muscle, and the islet cells um, and uh, cause diabetes mellitus. Uh, they also cause increasing visceral um, uh, storage around the neck, cause sleep apnea. 
uh, just the overall weight of fat uh, centrally, especially, uh, is going to lead to increasing body mass. And then we talk, we heard about cancers later. So this is a, I like to think about this as just a spinning wheel that goes faster and faster and faster. The nice thing is we have techniques now that can really sort of put a wrench in that and just shut this down and really start to reverse uh, a lot of these things. Okay. So uh, the link really about this is uh, insulin resistance. So when we develop a level of insulin resistance, that's when that wheel starts to spin faster and faster. And if all you're doing is just trying to uh, manage glycemia, you're really not uh, dealing with the underlying insulin resistance in the way you should. So if you can deal with the underlying insulin resistance, um, then that, that uh, really can help reverse uh, a, lot of, a lot of this. Okay. Um, this is a, a complicated slide. Uh, hopefully, we'll be getting a little bit more um, about this tomorrow in our GLP lecture. Um, I uh, know we were supposed to have a speaker just on sort of the neurobiology uh, of this. Uh, but bas the, uh, basically, what we're happening, as I mentioned to you, the hypothalamus controls the amount of fat. This is, we're finally at a point where I just came out that 60% of the doctors finally believe that obesity is an actual disease and not a, a lack of willpower. So that's actually awesome compared to what it was even five years ago. Still means that 40% of doctors still believe that obesity is, a lack, of, is a, a lack of willpower. But we know much, much more about uh, obesity as a disease of uh, dysregulation of the hypothalamus. Up here, the ventral medial hypothalamus is what uh, basically controls the amount of body fat through a number of different regulations. From there, we have the orexigenic centers and the anorexic centers, and they're, they're basically supposed to be balancing each other. Well, that isn't happening properly uh, in patients with obesity, and that's actually where a lot of our new medications are targeting to try to, to deal with those things. Uh, but it, uh, this, there's a tremendous amount of signaling that's going on, uh, partially from the adipocytes, uh, which uh, have to do with uh, leptin and insulin. Uh, you heard earlier uh, today uh, with the stomach about ghrelin. Uh, in the small intestine, a number of different peptides, including GLP-1, CCK, PYY, a number of different things. So all of these um, are just providing tremendous feedback. So this is why we generally will see the standard curve with self-managed diets especially, uh, of low-calorie diets, hypocaloric diets, of just a, a tremendous, just an initial drop and a flatten out and oftentimes a return to baseline is because you have these compensatory mechanisms uh, in play. So um, stay tuned for this. We're understanding more and more about this. This was um, basically not known less than 10 years ago, uh, and now we have more and more therapies around this, so it's a very exciting time. Uh, the bariatric surgeons have been able to show how they're able to alter this as well. So um, it, it's, um, this is sort of showing, uh, this is showing uh, that there is real interest, you know, that this is an underlying disease, complex disease with multiple different etiologies and pathways. Do we have any endocrinologists here in the room? We have one, okay, oh, two endocrinologists, okay. Good, I can make fun of two of you. If there were more, I'd be careful. <laughs> so uh, I must say, uh, up until about four or five years ago, uh, endocrinologists, I, I, I wouldn't see an endocrinologist at a meeting, uh, at an obesity meeting. They just weren't there because they felt like obesity was, was not really an endocrine disease. And now that they're seeing all of this stuff, it's like, oh, well, they've got all these great path, hormonal pathways. Maybe it is an endocrine disease. So more and more, we're starting to see our endocrinologists come in, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. Okay. So what are my messages? What are the messages that I carry with me and that I like to share with my, with my patients? So we have talked a long time about where uh, obesity is a disease of abnormal energy storage. Uh, it's a chronic condition. It's one of the places where, uh, and this is like in our first or second lecture to our, our new, new patients coming in, that they're really better, they're just incredible savers. And, and uh, at this point in time, we're just starting to get newer and newer therapies to help that they're saving less but uh, it's, still, it's still a challenge. So even if a person does lose a whole lot of weight, at this point in time, there's still going to be an obese person even in a thinner body, and that, for the most part, even applies for patients who had metabolic or bariatric surgery. Um, some of the newer thoughts about this, and as we understand the uh, concept of insulin resistance, think about diabetes and, um, as a disease of uh, carbohydrate intolerance. And if you think about it that way, it really helps to, to sort of guide 
how we should be treating this. So rather than sort of matching insulin to the amount of carbohydrate intake, we should be really, knowing that they're um, intolerant to carbohydrates, really trying to get those carbohydrates down rather than trying to match up insulin to carb ratios. Uh, we talked a little bit about that it's a chronic condition. Um, I think in a lot of cases, and actually it's now more with our patients than with the, our community physicians, uh, they feel like such a failure if they've lost weight and regained it. Uh, in our clinic, we welcome them back with, with open arms. And uh, we understand this involves very, uh, retreatment. Oftentimes it takes two or three times, um, or they're, when they are coming back, they're not coming back at quite the same high level of weight. So it is really, really important to let the patients know you are always there for them and you'll always welcome them back. They have a degree of self-shame that's something that needs to be addressed. So relapse and retreatment, we emphasize, uh, even from day one, um, that uh, a weight loss uh, phase of this is far from a, a cure. It's purely a, a treatment. Okay, so really in this day and age, uh, what should we be doing? Well, the standard of care, uh, I would still say, involves managing. Uh, using, um, if they're lucky, getting some nutritional therapy. They have uh, working with a diabetes educator. Um, in terms of working with a primary care physician, it's really hard to get nutritional education. They just don't have the time to do that. Um, otherwise, really, at least what I see in my community um, and in a lot of other communities when I've talked to physicians, is, is just loading up on more medications. You're just trying to maintain, you, you get graded on what your, hemoglobin, what your patient's hemoglobin A1C is. That's where the report cards come out. So you're going to do what is easiest and most powerful to do, which is to load them up on more medications. And then so very, very quickly, I noticed that patients get put on insulin much, much too soon when there are actually, uh, we know that there's uh, other other interventions or other medications that we can use uh, very effectively. So what do we mean when we talk about definition of remission? I think it's real important. The bariatric surgeons like to talk a lot about you know, putting patients into remission. Uh, they're better about, it. they used to talk about the cure, that they used to be the cure for diabetes. Um, and um, we, I have some slides later on that uh, they can certainly put most patients into remission. Um, curing, um, this is a chronic disease, so it's, it's very, very unlikely that way. So really what we're trying to do is uh, trying to achieve glycemia in the non-diabetic range. And uh, from there, there's sort of subcategories. Well, a partial remission of a hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5, a complete remission um, is when you're uh, less than 5.7 for one year, and then you know, the holy grail that we're all hoping for is prolonged um, remission at um, basically normal glycemia, less than 5.7 for uh, over five years. So that's the ultimate. Um, I think there's still evidence to show benefit uh, even at partial remission. Um, my goal, though, is to get these patients off their medications and then uh, getting them as close as possible, if not into remission. And we're able, I'll show you some data that uh, how we're able to do that. So um, this is the, um, let's talk a little bit about bariatric surgery here. So um, I, um, even though I'm a, a bariatric physician and internist, I refer regularly to uh, bariatric surgery. I must say, ethically, if I have a patient coming in to my clinic who comes into me for medical um, and behavioral weight loss, and they meet the criteria for bariatric surgery, I ethically feel like uh, I need to tell them, make sure that they are aware uh, that, um, that they have the option for bariatric surgery and that bariatric surgery, at least in this day and age right now, still is probably the most powerful, is the most powerful treatment uh, for a treatment of diabetes. And uh, it shouldn't be reserved for patients who are uh, of poorly controlled glucose. Uh, it needs to be offered uh, pretty early on. Uh, I even, I use EPIC and I, in part of my smart phrase, I even uh, notate, you know, discuss this with the patient. Yes, patient decides yes or no. Now, the reality is that um, only a small percentage of patients, less than 1% are getting bariatric surgery and there's probably reasons why for that. But, um, and, and I can talk to most of my patients coming in, I can talk to them about the importance of bariatric surgery and the benefit. The reality is they're either scared or they know somebody or they, uh, they just are reluctant to go for bariatric surgery. But at least I've done my due diligence. And in some cases, patients aren't really aware that they are candidates for bariatric surgery. And at least we get them to do some shared decision making around you know, what sort of options should they, should they do. So um, 
overall, what, what you can expect in terms of, of diabetes is at least three years of disease-free uh, di of diabetes following ruin y gastric bypass. A little less so, as you heard from Dr. Morton, about sleep gastrectomy. Um, some predictors, getting them in when they're younger uh, and that uh, when they have a shorter duration of diabetes, that's really, really critical. Uh, ideally, if they're not on insulin, um, and that, uh, that also they're, uh, they're going to achieve greater weight loss. All these are predictors of longer-term remission. Okay, so this is hot off the press. Just came out oh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, again, bariatric surgery, and I know it's a complicated slide, but it points to the fact that uh, we can't ignore bariatric surgery, and it really does need to be offered. So um, this is uh, from... Uh, um, uh, Kaiser Permanente, Fisher at Kaiser Permanente. One of the nice things about Kaiser is, uh, unlike patients moving from insurer to insurer, most people who are Kaiser patients stay in Kaiser for many, many years. So this was a study done. Uh, it was retrospective, but um, done of 20,000 patients who underwent bariatric surgery and could be followed nicely at, at Kaiser because they remain in the system. So what they showed was something that we really can't achieve through any other sort of treatment either standard of care for diabetes or even at that point in time sort of medical. What we see here, um, this is uh, basically non-surgical care of diabetes. Uh, and then here, this is bariatric surgery. And in all cases, this is um, all macrovascular disease events. Uh, this is coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular events, and all-cause mortality. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. So. Um, I am putting in a big plug here for bariatric surgery. I'll be talking a lot about medical therapy as well because I think we have a lot of good stuff to offer, and I see the uh, future where there's going to be more and more things uh, offered for patients uh, that can approach bariatric surgery, but we can't ignore this. And, and if you want to look at this, uh, this was just published in JAMA, I think about two weeks ago. There was a, another article that was really looking at being able to predict who's going to regain weight and how much. So again, using the same sort of data, really elegant studies, uh, and it's one of the better um, um, things to show the, the benefits of, of weight loss. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, intervention to get patients into, into um, nutritional intervention for diabetes. Um, it, it's something that I've really enjoyed doing uh, for now almost, almost 20 years, and uh, it, it's just, just an amazingly powerful thing. So I'm here to tell you uh, remission is achievable, and it, we're going to sort of, and, uh, part of the lectures in the next couple of days are to introduce to you to various different therapies that you can use in patients who have diabetes or, or pre-diabetes or metabolic, and metabolic disease. So um, the first thing uh, we're going to talk about is, uh, is a very low-calorie diet. Dr. Snyder is going to talk a little bit more about this, or a lot more about this, uh, tomorrow. But I at least want to introduce the concept uh, so that you're aware of this. And there are different very low-calorie diets. So in general, this is um, a, a prescribed uh, diet. Uh, it's been around uh, since the early 1970s, came out actually out of Harvard. Um, and um, it's been long since perfected. So the concept of most of the very low-calorie diets is a formulated, prepackaged um, meal replacements that are designed to completely replace uh, a patient's nutrition. So the, the goal of this is to get the patients out of risk, uh, but it is not a long-term cure for, uh, uh, for this. It is purely a tool to be used as part of the armamentarium. Uh, it's nutritionally complete. Patients cannot and should not do this with store-bought meal replacements that they get at Costco or Trader Joe's. Uh, these are designed um, to be nutritionally complete. Uh, it has all the recommended uh, uh, daily allowances uh, for vitamins, minerals, trace elements, fatty acids, and protein. The particular one I use uh, is about 150% uh, uh, of RDI for, uh, for protein. So we see very, very little, almost no um, muscle loss um, in our patients, uh, even though they lose 25 or 30% of their body weight. Um, in our particular case, there are different kinds of very low uh, calorie diets. You need to be aware of that. Um, uh, we uh, are favorite, uh, favored to those who are, that are very low in carbohydrates, um, and that does achieve a nutritional ketosis, a lot of which you heard about uh, before, and I'll be talking to you a little bit more about it later. Um, and the, the power of ketosis I'll, I'll go into in a moment. There are some formulations that all it is is just a very low-calorie diet. Carbohydrates are actually pretty high, and when you measure, if you were to measure serum ketones, it would be negligible. 
So there is evidence around those. I tend to find that they are a lot tougher because uh, patients are a lot hungrier. One of the benefits of ketones uh, is that it's an anorexic, um, it, it does suppress appetite. Uh, she was talking a lot about nausea. I would say that's um, a relatively small percentage of our patients who actually achieve that level. Uh, I must say, if, if I was just achieving nausea in a lot of my patients, I probably wouldn't have much of a practice. Uh, we see a rapid weight loss, very, very safe, um, and rapid resolution of their comorbidities. When you do something like this, uh, it does require medical supervision. Um, it's, uh, it's very straightforward. There's protocols around it. Um, you need to be trained on it, but it's not terribly difficult. And as I'm going to show you later on, it can be, even, it can be done in a primary care physician's office uh, should you want. And again, we emphasize when a patient inquires uh, for us to come to my weight loss center, uh, even in the initial call, we'll talk to them about uh, the fact that this is purely a tool and that they need to commit to long term. So my particular program is uh, basically three phases. There's a weight loss phase. It's by far the most dynamic where they're losing all this weight uh, and getting out of medical risk. There is a slow refeeding phase that lasts about six weeks or so, so we're getting back onto a diet. And the most critical part is um, a weight maintenance phase. We don't even call it maintenance because they haven't learned the skills yet to maintain. So that continues for another 12 to 18 months after they lost the weight. So um, unless the patients say, yes, I understand, I'm willing to commit to this, uh, we say it's not, we don't want it, we're not gonna do this. So really, really critical to understand this as a, as a chronic disease and, in, and incorporating in uh, some other tools, which we'll talk about. Okay. So um, what, are, what, what happens when we've been talking about ketones from the previous lecture and here, and um, uh, I think we'll probably hear a little bit more about them as well. What's really happening here? And uh, ketosis, and I, now we, I don't need to talk to you about uh, ketoacidosis. We have a wonderful buffering system that uh, really uh, does, would not occur. So what's happening here is free fatty acids um, are actually uh, combined to, to go into um, converting to acetyl-CoA, um, and I'm sorry for the biochemistry, at least I want to address it. Uh, you combine the two molecules into acetoacetic acid, um, and then uh, they break down into the ketone bodies, acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate. So these are the, the magical um, acetone and beta-hydroxybutyric acid or butyrate uh, are the two magical ketones uh, that we see. Uh, it's the acetone that generally gets blown off in the breath uh, that gives the people the, the fruity flavor, but these are what, uh, what uh, are magical. So how does it work? Well, these ketones, once they're uh, developed and they occur actually within a few hours of somebody not eating a meal, um, they basically it does require some insulin and a small amount of glucose. We still have a lot of circulating glucose through new gluconeogenesis. Um, and it goes into the wonderful Krebs cycle. I'm sorry to even bring up that word. Um, and uh, let me see, I thought I had it. Um, yeah, I'll show you a little bit later. So it goes through the Krebs cycle. That's how energy uh, is formed. By, so ketones are a wonderful, natural form of, of energy, backup energy, but they can be used as a primary energy storage. So uh, this is a typical example of what can happen on a very low calorie, very, uh, a nutri with nutritional ketosis. Uh, this is uh, about six, just four months uh, after starting it. And so you can see all the visceral fat um, that uh, uh, is here in the abdomen. And then 16 weeks later, it's pretty much all gone. Um, and the patients did lose a fair amount of weight, but almost all the weight that's lost is this biologically active fat. So this is why we see rapid resolution. And actually what's happening here is uh, the fat uh, here is heading into the pancreas, it's in the liver, it's quite honestly, it's in the heart as well, it's in now in the muscles, all rendering these various organs dysfunctional. So by rapidly getting rid of these, we're, we're really, as I mentioned to you, we're this, this malignant machine of metabolic disease, we're throwing a wrench into this and rapidly able to reverse things. Okay, so well, how do you, we use these in, in diabetes? Uh, well, a few different ways. This is basically the various origins of, a, of our uh, nutrition. So um, very low calorie diets have protein. Uh, they have uh, a small amount of carbohydrate. Um, and then other sources are muscle protein and then our adipose tissues. So all of these go together. Um, the muscle can form into, um, into glucose because we need a little glucose. Plus the very low calorie diet has uh, carbohydrate as well. Um, and so... 
Uh, these then go, um, f ketones are formed, and the ketones can be used very nicely to power our heart, kidney, muscle, um, and also even the brain as well. Uh, but there is still a residual amount of glucose, so people do not get hypoglycemic on this diet. Uh, it's, their glucose, their insulin resistance just goes away, it normalizes. They became euglycemic very, very quickly, uh, but not hypoglycemic. And so you have just enough glucose going around to help, but also ketones are really your primary source of energy. So what's really, how, what's the magic behind this? And I think this is also the magic behind bariatric, the rapid resolution for bariatric surgery as well, is that we're seeing uh, just a really quick improvement in hepatic insulin sensitivity. Um, and I've got a couple of slides to show you, and normalization of beta cell function. We think the major reason is that there's a fair amount of lipotoxicity. The, the fat that's stored and the free fatty acids that are stored in the pancreas are just um, causing, uh, just, um, uh, just, they just stun the beta cells. So one of the nice things that is really happening is if you catch somebody whose diabetes less than seven or eight years, oftentimes when we get them off their um, off their insulin, they don't really need insulin. They actually start to produce their own uh, endocrine in, um, um, insulin function again, restore it. So, okay. So what's happening in the liver? Um, this uh, shows uh, normalization. Uh, uh, this is uh, what's happening after um, just even a couple of weeks. Very, very rapid resolution. Uh, this is fasting plasma glucose down toward, towards normal. Um, and also we see this is hepatic triglyceride. Um, and this is one of the major reasons why the very low calorie diet has become fairly standard for bariatric surgery practices. Uh, they do it generally for about two weeks prior, some version of it um, for two weeks prior to surgery because it shrinks the liver uh, by about 15%. So it makes it, besides normalization of glucose, which reduces infection rate and better outcomes, also makes it much, much easier for the surgeon to be able to visualize the, the foregut and do their surgery. So they've quickly adopted at least short-term use of this. And um, you know, I'm pleased to see Dr. Morton really trying to look at other therapies as well, understanding that um, you just can't use one therapy. You need to use a variety of different things. Okay. So we see very, very rapid resolution in beta cell function. Um, and it, again, it's so nice to see that just everything just sort of goes back to normal. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, I will go ahead and skip this. But um, uh, if you were to be able to see this, I don't know why I got stretched. Um, I'll, I'll make sure it's okay on your handouts. That the first phase insulin in response to a carbohydrate intake uh, basically it goes back to normal. It should be what a non-diabetic is, where you have a fairly rapid rise in insulin and a fairly rapid drop off versus a, a diabetic where they have a rise and it stays up there and it's delayed and it slowly passes off. We see it normalize into those. Again, a, a previous diabetic, uh, they get normalization of their, of their first phase insulin response. Okay. So um, what what is the practical outcome? What do we see in our patients when we take a diabetic and put them on, um, on, on a very low calorie diet, a very low carbohydrate diet as well? Uh, this was a study done by uh, one of um, uh, my colleagues. Uh, he's in Missouri. Uh, and this was a, a small group of his patients. I'll show you, show you my data a little bit later on, um, where he put patients on a, on a diet. And uh, this is, you know, in Missouri, and they, they like, uh, they're, they're, they have a fair uh, big obesity problem there. So um, the, the average patient was able to drop down from 283 pounds down to 195. The fasting glucose dropped by about 40%. Uh, total cholesterol, you know, dropped a little bit. HDL increased a little bit. Uh, LDL uh, dropped a little bit. Quite honestly, what we see is it's all, as, uh, it's all over the board. But uh, most importantly, triglycerides dropped as well by almost 60%. 60, 60 so again, rapid, rapid resolution. Uh, we're happy because we're taking the patients off. We, we see their hemoglobin A1C go down to, into the normal range again. Um, and in general, what he saw uh, was about a 2% drop in hemoglobin A1C. So uh, from the time, initial time to the time of drop. So. Um, my point is, uh, other than bariatric surgery, which is not a, not a medicine or whatever, what drug can lead to a combination of you know, a drop in normalization of blood pressure, uh, re improvement in renal function? 
There used to be a fear that these types of diets would impair or cause renal damage. Uh, quite the opposite. We generally see improvement uh, in renal function. And we will take patients uh, who have stage three chronic kidney disease, even up to stage four now. We were regularly referred by the nephrologist because all the inflammatory process that's going on uh, with um, diabetes just goes away and renal function rapidly improves. Uh, we see cardiac function improve, uh, rapid resolution in congestive heart failure. Uh, we, uh, in the bariatric surgical population, uh, we've seen and I've seen anecdotally in our area that atrial fibrillation uh, actually oftentimes will go away. Uh, again, that has to do with the lipotoxicity in the heart. Uh, and then the edema goes away. There's a diuretic effect of, of ketones. Uh, sleep improves. Uh, their focus improves. Um, we see rapid improvement in depression and uh, quality of life. Um, obviously, as they're losing weight, um, arthritis improves as well. And oftentimes, amazingly enough, GERD improves. Probably a number of different reasons, but central abdominal pressure uh, is decreased when they lose a lot of weight. So pretty striking what we can do with just a little bit of a diet. And uh, again, I think uh, these, this diet has been around since perfected. It's easy. It's palatable. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, we'll have another discussion about it tomorrow. Uh, there should be really no reason why this isn't being offered at the forefront. The ADA gives small mention to very low-calorie diets and says, well, it might be a good idea, but um, uh, you know, that needs to be done under medical supervision. It was just a very small, small piece. But the fact is, we can really um, do tremendous amounts uh, with uh, n nutritional intervention. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I, it's interesting that we're having, I went fine, just fine. Okay. So uh, let's talk about pharmacotherapy, uh, obesity pharmacotherapy. And uh, Dr. Lazarus is going to be speaking a lot more, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. And I'm only going to just show you uh, the slides around uh, obesity pharmacotherapy for diabetes, where it is. So all four of the new drugs um, really have shown benefits either in diabetes or prediabetes. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on here since it's a diabetes talk. So uh, this is fentramine and topiramate, otherwise known as Qsimia, um, and one of their trials which, um, which basically showed a uh, decrease in weight. Uh, uh, let me see if I have the other uh, study. This was their total weight. I appears to be, I, um, I, I grabbed this wrong slide, but basically what they showed was a decreased um, uh, um, uh, delay of onset of diabetes, as, as these other ones will show as well. Probably just a direct weight loss effect, but uh, still, it's still quite, quite dramatic. Okay. Um, this is uh, just off the press as well, uh, from October of Lancet. Uh, Belvic, um, Lorcaserin, uh, is a medicine that's now been out about four or five years. Um, it is uh, probably one of the least prescribed anti-obesity medicines, um, and it's really not being even marketed very much at this point. It's considered sort of a pharmacotherapy failure, uh, mostly because people are looking at sort of average weight loss. And as a standalone medication, um, um, you'll have patients who, want, they, don't, they don't feel the dramatic effects. It doesn't have an upper type of effect. It can be very, very subtle. But in the group of, of patients, um, a certain group of patients, they actually can have a very nice response. And what they basically showed was um, this is uh, also a, a marked delay versus placebo. Uh, they did uh, the, the green here is this is the onset of to di from tree diabetes to diabetes. So, um, and this goes out for three years, a, a, um, a significant difference in terms of going from prediabetes to diabetes. So just adding this medication on uh, can show a delay. And this is just, um, just, um, uh, just published. I'm hoping some of these things and as anti-obesity medicines become better covered under uh, health insurance, if, that, if and when that happens, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to start to use these medicines uh, more and more because um, I've used them and they can be very, very effective. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring in uh, liraglutide um, in its higher dose known as Saxenda. Um, it's, in terms of the treatment of diabetes, they didn't really do that with Saxenda because it's Victoza, so we already know its effect in treatment of diabetes. But they did do the three-year trial in terms of uh, the uh, degree of uh, patients where um, in terms of onset to diabetes, from pre-diabetes to diabetes. So uh, there was, again, um, patients who were put on, uh, who were on placebo, about 9% of them after three years went on to having diabetes, only 2% uh, who were put on liraglutide 
uh, th the, the higher dose. So again, um, while this is pre-diabetes to diabetes, uh, we know uh, through its long-standing use as an anti-diabetes medicine, its effectiveness. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, combination therapies because I would say that each one of these standalone um, isn't enough, but it is really a matter of finding uh, combinations of things that will work and uh, to some degree trying to individualize that uh, to your patients, but at least offering this to them and working with them uh, on this. So um, this is um, our, our study that we've just, uh, are just about to publish on diabetes. Uh, what we do is very low-calorie diets plus very intensive behavioral care. When we use weight loss medications, in our case, because we achieve a significant amount of weight loss just with the diet alone, we tend to use them more for weight maintenance to avoid weight regain. That's really what, what we're about is avoiding re weight regain. So we have our, um, our best effectiveness in terms of, of avoiding weight as a long-term sort of a, to keep the patients basically in remission. And that, that's a, a, general, a general approach. So our patients with uh, prediabetes, um, I, I've got these switched around. Our patients uh, started out um, uh, with, this is prediabetes down here. They started out with a, pre, um, a hemoglobin A1C of 5.9 and they, um, they went down to 5.5%. Uh, which is about a 7% drop. On average, we see, in, even with a diabetic, diabetics can be very, very difficult to lose weight, but we see about a 25% drop in body weight. Really quite magical. They feel really, really good. Uh, we see a dramatic drop in waist circumference, a 30% drop in triglycerides. Um, essentially not a whole lot of change at all um, in LDL and HDL. Um, the systolic and diastolic blood pressures drop a little bit as well, which is part of weight loss as well as part of nutritional ketosis. So that's in our pre-diabetes um, uh, population. In our diabetes population, um, a lot of our patients come in, you know, not on ideal control, although in our area, the uh, endocrinologists or the diabetes center oftentimes won't see a patient unless their hemoglobin A1C is well above 8 uh, we want to intervene much earlier. So this is, on average, we're going from 7.9 down to uh, 6.1. Um, and we're seeing, again, a drop of about 23% of body weight. Um, and so a uh, marked reduction in triglycerides. So all very, very positive things. So some of our patients, we are able to get into the true definition of remission. Uh, we certainly can with prediabetes. Diabetes, it is definitely harder. Uh, our population tends to be, uh, at least recently, it tends to be a little bit older. But uh, still, we can at least get them towards there. And the, this, again, this is an average. We have a number of patients uh, who uh, are in remission, and then we work to maintain them in remission. And we combine that with behavioral care and then uh, adding on pharmacotherapy and other nutritional therapies as well. So that's using a formulated diet. Do you absolutely have to do that? No. Um, is it effective? Absolutely. Is, it, uh, is patients happy with it? Absolutely. So that's been our tool, but there are other things coming down the pipeline, and I, I do want to share this with you. Uh, there was a mention uh, earlier about Verta Health. I'm going to show their studies, and I don't know, there may be some other things as well. Anybody know about Verta Health? Anyone raise? Okay, a couple of you. So uh, Verta Health, it's sort of an interesting story. Um, there, uh, the, my predecessor, Dr. Finney, has been a um, he was one of the founders of these ketogenic diets um, and uh, was, has been really espousing this for many, many years um, and when he was a professor of nutrition at UC Davis, but really was never getting any traction uh, and really, really struggled. He felt like you know, Don Quixote and, and fighting the windmills because low fat was in during his time. And uh, even though he had you know, published good evidence around it, it just wasn't really being accepted. So um, he still continued on his mission and, um, and there was another uh, an exercise physiologist, uh, Jeff Volek, who's at um, Ohio State, uh, who uh, does a lot as well with athletes. And one of the things that was happening was he was actually taking athletes, especially, especially ultramarathoners, instead of carb loading them, he was actually putting them on nutritional, in nutritional ketosis, and they were winning the ultramarathon races. So it, that piqued the interest of certain people. And then they really hit the jackpot. Uh, there's this gentleman named Sam Inikin. This, this is Bay Area, Silicon Valley stuff. But uh, there's a gentleman named Sam Inikin. And Sam is a dot -comer. Uh, He built Trulia.com, which is a real estate um, um, app uh, or web, and sold it and made his millions. 
Um, and he was, an, he was a triathlete, but he also had prediabetes. He was really frustrated by it. And then uh, after, upon selling it, he and his wife decided to row to Hawaii from California. I mean, just, you know, a little bit. But even then, he said he felt lousy because he could not get under good glycemic control. So he ended up seeing, uh, running into Dr. Volokh or getting, uh, and then Dr. Finney as well. They sort of work in tandem, and they, they produce books as well. And um, so Dr. Or Sam Inikin uh, basically initially funded, uh, I think initially $35 million for a startup of Verta Health. And their mission is through nutritional support and medical management and coaching is to decrease the number of diabetes, I think, by 25 million in the United States by 20, 20 million by 2025. I believe that's the result. And um, what they are trying to do is actually try to produce some really good studies. So it's fairly quiet now. They've only actually sort of been out there for about a year because they want to actually prove their, their data. So what they are doing is a five-year um, study uh, looking at the use of uh, basically nutritional ketosis. We're not even talking about you know, hypocaloric, trying to get the patients to lose weight. This is purely for treatment of diabetes, and they're less concerned about the amount of calories. Uh, and they're, they're focused. They have physicians who are working to get the patients, manage the patients off their diet. This is all done remotely, by the way. So they're based out of San Francisco. So what they, this is their one-year data. They're soon going to be publishing their two-year data, and they're funded um, very well to, to continue on. Uh, it's, I think they're up to 65 or $70 million of funding because other dot-com companies, when you get one guy in, more and more come in. So I'm excited about this because um, in the medical weight loss side of things, it's very hard to get that level of support. And that's why there are fewer studies. When it comes to bariatric surgery, they have some of the bigger surgical companies, the equipment companies, that have funded a lot of the research uh, because it, it pays. So they've, the, um, the bariatric surgeons have done a, a wonderful job with producing outcome studies in ways that, that we can't. Um, but we're starting to see more. Yes? Can you define behavioral care? Yes. Uh, so uh, behavioral care, there's a lot of different approaches to it, but it generally involves a degree of, a, um, I like to talk about um, um, be, uh, sort of an adult learning, but also it's more educational theory. So what we're trying to do is take a patient and alter their lifestyle, uh, to get them to really make long-term behavioral changes. And uh, that's been studied um, uh, for a long, long time. That's part of uh, the original like lean programs with Dr. Wadden that was talked about earlier at Yale. Um, and what they show, if you just do behavioral care only, you do achieve about a 2 or 3% weight loss uh, that can be maintained. It's tough. So as a standalone, it's probably not enough. So you need to do other tools. So what we're trying to do is get patients to make long-term behavioral change. So this is why when I hear, well, diets don't work. Well, and, and you know, you've got to stick. It's got to be whatever the patient is willing to stick to. We have the ability through... Uh, lifestyle therapy or behavioral care, intensive lifestyle intervention, there's different terms for it. Some people refer to it as educational coaching. We can help our patients. We can nudge our patients and get them to the point. It's just not a quick thing. It takes a little bit of work. Okay? So uh, this is what Verda is doing. They have coaches, and this is actually being done uh, at the University of Indiana or one of their satellite uh, clinics as part of it. And uh, this is after their first year. Uh, they were actually able, they used the term reversal, uh, I, I like to, that's, or remission. They were able to uh, reverse or remit 60% uh, of uh, their diabetic patients. Um, and 94% of uh, patients, apologize, um, were able to reduce or eliminate their insulin levels. Uh, they saw about a 1.3% drop in hemoglobin A1C. And again, they're not trying to achieve weight loss. Um, they're just trying to get the patients on a very low carbohydrate diet to get them into a level of nutritional ketosis. Uh, on average, they saw about a 30-pound weight loss. Again, that's not the primary endpoint. And they had actually really good retention. Weight loss studies are very, very difficult uh, because of the drop-off. But um, uh, because it's a well-funded study and it's done in a rural part or just um, in, in Indiana, they're able to keep uh, a really nice retention. So they're doing a very nice job. I think the two-year data is going to be published here very soon. So again, what did, uh, what did they say? And this is, I, I hate to use the word diet. This is really a ketogenic lifestyle. Uh, and uh, um, I, they're showing that basically it is possible 
to not only use keto ketosis for getting patients out of risk, but actually maintaining a degree of nutritional ketosis. So as I mentioned, they had an uh, improvement. This was um, a placebo versus um, or usual care versus um, their diet, you know, a drop in hemoglobin C, of course, glucose. Uh, they're, they measured serum insulin levels that dropped. Uh, insulin sensitivity through home IR uh, dropped dramatically, and they were able to keep the, get the patients off uh, most of their medication, diabetes medications. So, except for metformin, and uh, like Dr. Morton is talking about, I generally try to keep patients on uh, on metformin as well long term if they can tolerate it. Okay. So. Um, Let's talk about some other things that you can combine. Well, intensive lifestyle intervention, that is, uh, again, it can be either group coaching or one-on-one -on -one care. Interestingly enough, Medicare does cover this. It is covered under Medicare. Um, it, uh, it has been poor, very poorly uh, used for a number of different reasons. One is it's requiring the physician uh, or the provider, the mid, can be a mid-level provider as well, to do the care. So this does take time. It, it does take some, a little bit of training to do this. Um, number two, it's very, very poorly reimbursed. I think the re average reimbursement is about $22 or $23. And, um, and you really can't be doing anything else with this, with this patient. So it, it's uh, something that's been shown to be effective. Um, it's part of the Affordable Care Act because it um, has been shown to be effective. But it, it's, it's not, the incentives aren't right, aren't there. But uh, this was a, a study that was uh, done in JAMA in 2012. Actually, this is the look ahead study. So the, the big, big study that was looking at lifestyle intervention and prevention of coronary artery disease, it was stopped early because it did not show any benefit for uh, cardiovascular disease. But they then looked at cohorts and what was happening. And so there was a cohort of patients who lost a lot of weight. And, um, and, and, what they, and they looked at uh, diabetes support versus intensive lifestyle intervention. And in this particular case, and they used meal replacements as well. Um, this wasn't necessarily like a very low calorie diet. They just basically gave them, instead to replace a meal, uh, something easy to eat that was nutritious. So um, they saw a much, much better uh, improvement um, in, in more intensive um, lifestyle intervention than uh, just usual care of support and education. Okay. Okay. So what is the other evidence? Well, uh, this was just done um, pre uh, in, in England, the United Kingdom, where I think they've now caught up to us in, in terms of obesity and diabetes. So we're, uh, I think uh, Mexico may be a little ahead of us now, um, but uh, it's not necessarily a good honor at all. So they're trying to, the national government there uh, um, is trying to figure out, well, what do they do about their problem? Because it's getting rapidly worse as well. So they basically train primary care doctors to put patients on a very low calorie diet. And they have a, certain formulations in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, they was basically direct primary care uh, done. Um, relatively little behavioral care, which I think was a mistake, but again, they're just trying to show proof of concept. So they had an intervention arm, and then they had a control arm. Uh, they had about 150 uh, patients, and these were generally uh, diabetes. Uh, and the fact is that 46% um, uh, of the patient were able to achieve and um, maintain remission. Again, a very, very simple intervention. Um, and that um, you know, a number of patients were able to achieve weight loss at one year, uh, about um, 10, it's about 20, 22 kilograms, 22 pounds, I mean, versus about six or seven pounds. So even um, uh, you know, using some of these tools uh, can really make a big difference, even if you're just almost just throwing it out there. So compare this to what we are currently doing of saying, well, uh, if they're lucky, they'll get some sort of a carb a carb diet where they have to match their insulin or their medications to carbohydrates, and then they eat more, they just need to increase their insulin and just balance this. That is if they're lucky and they get that at all. In fact, we can actually, there are active ways of, interven of intervening that can actually uh, put the diabetes into remission. Uh, this uh, shows, this is the graph that shows what happened in the, uh, in the British study, that uh, this was... Um, uh, the gray here is follow-up, and this is the baseline. And what you're seeing here, um, this is hemoglobin A1C here, is a, a push back uh, to basically normalization of glycemia with measured by hemoglobin A1C. Okay. 
So um, this um, is a summary, but basically uh, the current standard of care um, is a disease management where we're just sort of managing it rather than trying to actually intervene. And I think uh, what we know, we have, uh, we have tools that we can use, therapies we can use. And I do believe that sort of our standard of care as it still exists and is written in the, in the national guidelines for diabetes is hampering our efforts to do more. And, and I think we should do more. Uh, remission, as, we, as I've shown you, has both uh, medical and surgical options. Uh, both should be considered and you should talk with the patient about this. Um, that, um, that in fact, nutritional therapies primarily based around low carbohydrate, true low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate with nutritional ketosis uh, can be very, very effective in, and is evidence-based in treating diabetes. Um, all the anti-obesity medicines uh, in the last four years or so have shown benefits both in terms of uh, preventing pre-diabetes to diabetes as well as um, intervention for it. We saw drops in hemoglobin A1C with all these anti-obesity medicines. And that please consider uh, combining tools. And I'm happy to talk with you about how I've combined the tools. Uh, there's a number of us who've been in practice for a while who we combined, and everyone does it slightly differently, and there's different communities. So for instance, in my community, anti-obesity medicines are really, really hard to get, get approved, so I have to be a little bit more creative. Just down the road from me, uh, about, um, about 200 miles away is Fresno, California, which is actually one of the poorest cities they have awesome coverage for anti-obesity medicines. So it just varies by location. If you're in New Jersey, you have great coverage for anti-obesity medicine. So it's, it's very patchy. I'm hoping very soon in the next few years uh, that, that anti-obesity medicines will be covered in the same way anti-hypertensive or asthma medicines. What we're waiting on is Medicare needs to cover this. And so uh, there's active every year it's been coming up. Uh, I think once that happens, that will start to open the door a little bit more. But already things are starting to improve. So again, we pick the, pick the combinations of things that you think will work best in your patient population. Every place is a little bit different. But when you combine these, you can have a really awesome, awesome outcome. So um, I think we'll leave some time. This is, uh, I missed Halloween with my uh, family. Um, and we had apparently had a, uh, my poor, poor puppy was Yoda. Um, and then my stepdaughter here was, um, uh, well, I'm a, Princess Leia, and then uh, so her favorite. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. This has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.